verse 28, just as the man, son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and be a ransom for many. So I'll give a little background with you for this. You say one day, John and James, who were brothers, and their mother came up to Jesus with a bold request. That is, to occupy seats in the highest places of honor when the kingdom comes. Maybe they were foolishly thinking that uh, positions of authority and influence could give them um, true satisfaction. And that attitude reflected the ambition to be somebody substituting power for love. So this made the rest of the disciples indignant. So what did Jesus do? He called for his disciples and told them, whoever wants to be the greatest or first in the kingdom must be a servant or a slave. Okay. Now, Jesus taught his disciples, and he wants us to know too, that instead of seeking glory and security in terms of the world's standards, he wants us to learn that we could receive by giving, that we could learn, we should lead by serving, and we should live our lives by losing them. No. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven, what is greatness? It is never found in positions in, in titles or praises of men. And greatness is not defined by superior abilities. It's not defined by your, your, your talent, your mm -hmm. wisdom. But greatness is seen through servant qualities of compassion, of humility and kindness. Now, let me ask you a question. What do kings, rulers, and rich people have in common besides riches. They have servants, right? <laughs> servants who wait on them. Servants who do everything for them. But you would ask, what about Jesus? Isn't he the king of kings and the lord of lords? Amen. Then why then would he stoop too low and refuse to be served but become a servant instead for us. Hey, you see, Jesus, you know, we know, came to the world without pomp and glory, but he emptied himself by living a life of humility, ministering to the people, healing the sick, the blind, the crippled, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, teaching the people, the race whom he was the same. You see, even, even if he was uh, armed with power and wisdom, he set aside all of these. <coughs> At his command were legions of angels. At his fingertips was power, for he could annihilate all his enemies. In his mind was omniscience, wherein he could foresee the plans of his enemies. For again, he could uh, stop his enemies' plans and could easily have saved his life. But Jesus knew that he has to reframe this power for a greater glory. The glory or the joy of bringing glory to the Father. Okay. You see, Jesus labored for the people and his service was his way of showing that he cared for us. Yeah. Now, according to the world's standards, we are to achieve. We are to excel at any cost. We have to manage, we have to gain, we have to be the best in everything. We are to be superior in everything, right? But if we were to mature, into Christ-like character, we must give ourselves into ministry and serve others. Mm -hmm. But sad to say that there are some of us who are more occupied with ourselves 
pursuing our own comfort and making satisfaction the goal of our life. It's all about self-fulfillment and, and, and enjoying the thrills of life. I'd like to relate this uh, a little story where in we can relate and identify with. So here's a, a CEO, a president of a company, and his wife. They were standing uh, by the door of the airport waiting for the limousine to pick them up. They had been uh, from a month-long vacation touring different cities of Europe. So here comes a shabbily dressed man, obviously a homeless man, holding a sign. What sign is that? Big yes. word for food, right? So he approached the couple and said, he was asking for a few cents to buy him uh, a cup of hot coffee because he was shivering in the cold. By the way, it was a cold winter morning. You know what the couple did? They looked annoyed. They looked at him from head to toe and snubbed him and just rode the limousine with the same anger word to him. Okay? Can you relate to that? So how many homeless people have become victims of apathy, of indifference, of insensitivity from society. Now, some of us would say, oh, those homeless people are just a bunch of lazy, idle folks. They deserve what they get. No, Christians, say that, right? They deserve it. Now, as Christians, we are not supposed to be judgmental. We are not supposed to be hasty in our conclusions because we are not privy to their private lives. And besides, we are not aware of the circumstances that have led them to that miserable plight. Okay. Or when we say those nasty things about these homeless people, are uh, we trying to cover up for the hardness of our hearts? So is this our idea of loving God? To love God is to serve Him. And to serve Him is to serve others. Right? Because love is the foundation of service. And service is best expressed in, in actions more than in words. First John 18 says, Let us not love in words and in speech but in actions and in truth. Now, what does love look like? Well, I'm not referring to the Eros type of love, not the emotional thing. Love in so far as service is concerned. This is what love is. Love has the hands that serve others. Love has the feet that can hasten to the poor and the needy. Love has the eyes that can see hunger and want. And love has the ears that can hear the sighs and the groanings of the sick and the hungry. This is love. Okay. Mother Teresa. Sour. <laughs> there you go. Mother Teresa, the beloved nun of India, who I think is once just blessed, blessed, one step before saintly. This is what she said, and I quote, it's there. Love in action is service. Try to give unconditionally whatever a person needs at the moment. The point is to do something, however small, and show you care through your actions by giving your time. We are all God's children, so it is important to share His gifts. Do not worry why problems exist in the world. Just respond to people's needs. We may feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, but that ocean will be less without that drop. Okay? The question now is, why is it that even among us Christians, 
we find it hard helping others. Hmm. We choose to be unmindful. We choose to be uncaring to those around us. We think we are too important, right? Or too busy to be involved. Why do we struggle helping those whom we think can help us back? And why do we do this when we know it's wrong? Okay. This is not what God wants us to do. God wants to accept us, wants us to accept all people as equally important because they are all created in His image. Okay. God wants us to embrace people as they are. He wants us to appreciate them regardless of color or background or their status. Okay. Say and do something that would bless them. Remember that God does not play favorites. God generously loves us, so he wants us to do the same. Didn't Jesus tell us in Matthew 25? For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you let me in. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you have done to the least of your brethren, you have done unto me. So, when do we serve others? People would say, well, mind your own business. No. Here's the story. There was a certain man who made a list of about 101 reasons why he was thankful. And he placed this list in front of his refrigerator. And that list reminded him how blessed he was. So he made a commitment to, to serve somebody, to, to do something good to at least one person each passing day. So are would be immensely blessed too? God has given us so much, right? Look at this precious gift of life. When we woke up this morning, the beating of our heart is the first miracle that we experience. The gift of salvation. Look at the beauty of nature. Look at the sun and the rain that, that, uh, that uh, are given for our crops, the food on our table, the air that we breathe, the modern inventions that bring delight and entertainment in our lives. Facebook, what else? Skype, Instagram, what else? What are you, teenagers? They bring delight to us. You can, you can communicate with people across the miles. Okay? Now, how should these blessings impact our lives? Well, the more blessed we are, the more we should want to share. The more gratitude we have, the more we should want to serve others. We want everyone to to we want everyone around us to enjoy the blessings that we have. Our friends, our families, our neighbors, even strangers. Okay. Thankfulness motivates us to do things for others. Not because we have to, not because God will like us more, but we serve others because this is the only meaningful response for all the blessings that we have received. Okay. The, the prophet Samuel said, be sure to fear the Lord, serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. So you would say, in what way will I, will I serve? Okay. We could do volunteer work in the community, out of its projects, like we did before, we went to all the nursing homes. You can do, you can visit the jail. You can visit the incarcerated, like June, Brother June's uh, ministry. You can visit the elderly. You can make use of your gifts, like baking, 
cooking, carpentry, uh, computer, computer expertise, electronics, and a thousand more ways. Okay. You see, the Apostle Peter said, um, each one should use whatever gifts he has received to serve others as good stewards of God's grace. God intends his church to be a network of people whose talents and abilities complement each other. Amen. You know, we know some people, right, who are very passionate in serving. They even sell their possessions. They, they leave their comfort zone to go to the mission field to, to spread the gospel, right? This is wonderful. But wow. serving does not always have to be a huge event. We do not have to sell our possessions in order to serve. We can serve in our own simple ways. Look at this church. This is, this is the church of the Lord. This is the church that we are God. Okay? This church needs our service. For example, working in the nursery teaching the kids in their Sunday school, preparing communion elements, checking or preparing the sanctuary before and after service, checking the bathrooms, and saying, okay, we have a paper liner, instead of complaining, just do it. Okay. Yes. Amen. Uh, prepare, okay. uh, sending a phone call to those people who need some, some encouragement. Yes. Opening your house for Bible study and a hundred more ways to help other church that we all love. Okay. It is the small things, the, the things or doing things behind the scenes that many of us are reluctant to do because we want to be what there is attention. Okay? The church is blessed when we do the small things, when we do the small jobs. This shows that our self-worth uh, is not based on our personal titles or positions. Okay. Besides, there is no small service for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Here's a little joke. I don't know if you can get it. <laughs> After the service, a pastor pulled uh, uh, somebody. Hey, I heard that you are a jack of all trades. Why don't you join us? Oh, I do, said the man. But how come I see you only on Christmas and, and Thanksgiving? So what the, the guy said. Oh, yes, because I am in the secret service. That's what he said. <laughs> oh, you didn't get it, right? <laughs> okay. okay, there are two kinds of people in the church. And according to the statistics, church statistics, in a majority of churches, mega churches, small churches, about 10% of the congregation <coughs> do the main work mm -hmm. in the church, while 90% sit and watch others do the work. I don't know what you fall into. <laughs> no. what, what are some reasons, or what, what is keeping people from serving God or serving others? What are some excuses they say? Oh, they don't will say, oh, I'm too young to do that. The old people will say, oh, I'm too old to do that. <laughs> the others will say, oh, the job in the church is uh, the responsibility of the pastors and the ministers. Others will say, I have no talent. I have no skill. I have nothing to offer. I have some limitations. And on and on. Okay. Remember that God can use every one of us despite our limitations, despite our imperfections, despite our weaknesses, right? You see, those who refuse to serve do not have the love for God in them. They are like the Dead Sea where nothing survives. You see, the Dead Sea has one inlet where the water from the Jordan River flows in but nothing goes out. So we cannot just be inlets or, or takers.
we need to be givers. We need to have outlets where we can give of ourselves. Okay? Now, question. Has God been asking you to do something for him? That you have been dismissing it or ignoring it because you feel that you're inadequate or unqualified. Did you tell yourself, huh, who am I that God would send me? Okay, remember in the Bible that God had used imperfect and insignificant people to fulfill his purpose. That to mention a few, that's how Gideon. Gideon, for example, wasn't Gideon used by God to lead an army of 300 against the Midianites who were so numerous? Now this was the Gideon, the same Gideon who said, oh, I cannot save Israel because my clan is the weakest and I am the least important person in my father's house. What did God say? I will be with you. And he gave Gideon the victory, right? Okay. Moses was a stutterer, mm -hmm. speech defect. And he was reluctant to face the mighty Pharaoh. But with God's power, he was able to say, let my people go, right? Mm -hmm. Because of God. Okay. Jonah was so scared to go to Nineveh. But he realized that he could not resist God's will. Now, Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, Oh, I cannot speak for you because I am too young. What did God say? You will go wherever I send you. You will speak whatever I tell you. I will take care of you. I will be with you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Hey, these are just a few of the significant, insignificant, imperfect people that God used to fulfill his purpose. So what does this tell us? Let us not sell ourselves short, okay? When we are weak, God is strong, okay? And we can do everything through him who gives us strength. What is important is we make ourselves available and God will use us. Okay. We do not have to disqualify ourselves from serving others just because of our limitations. Mm -hmm. Because God's presence in our life is the only qualification we need yeah. to fulfill His purpose to serve others. Yeah. Now God wanted His church to function on the basis of service. He wanted us to have a servant heart. What is a servant? We don't have servants here, right? We have a lot of servants in the Philippines. <laughs> a servant is one who doesn't want, who doesn't need to be told and doesn't expect any reward or praise. A servant also is one who in positions of leadership, okay, has the commitment to to to, to serve, has the he has he, he has to do everything it takes to do what is best for the congregation. It has been about five years when Typhoon Haiyan, also known as Typhoon Yolanda, hit the Philippines on November 8, 2013. That was the strongest typhoon terms of wind speed as the deadliest on record, killing at least 10,000 people, shattering more than a million homes, and forcing the evacuation of more than 800,000 people. So when this um, typhoon happened, public infrastructure, agriculture, communication, transportation, were completely destroyed. And it was a pitiful sight when the streets were littered with dead bodies. The cities were flattened and the people were washed away in the floods and mothers were wading in just high waters, calling out to their children, to the babies, only to be stepping on their dead bodies under the water. So, 
It was indeed a terrible nightmare, misery beyond death. With no food, no shelter, no, no, no clothing except for the wet shirts on their back. That was horrible. But then, but then, we saw the solidarity of the Philippine nation that was struck by tragedy. Everyone offered a little of what they had. Time, effort, money, personal belongings, um, their vehicles, delivery of uh, relief goods. And there were 36 foreign nations who gave a generous amount uh, that totaled $86.5 million. So it could have been, it was, it was the, the worst, it could have been the worst storm, but it brought out the best in mankind. Because we saw the outpouring of love. We saw the love and support among the people, sharing the burdens. It was compassion at its best, where people translated their faith into action. And despite the ugliness of the physical surroundings, it was a still a beautiful world because people were holding hands. They joined hands, helping each other. This morning, I encourage you to find a way of service. To serve and not to deserve. We do not have to wait for a tragedy to happen. We do not have to wait for a disaster to happen because opportunities to serve abound. The fear right, the fear left. There are ways, many ways to serve. Okay. William Penn, I would like to quote William Penn. I expect to pass through this life but once. If there is kindness that I can show or any good thing that I can do to my fellow being, let me do it now. I will not defer it or neglect it, for I may not pass this way again. Emily Dickinson said, and I quote, if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life from aching, or pull one's pain, or help a fainting robin back to its nest. I have not lived in vain. Mm -hmm. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us always remember that the things of this world are worthless. But heaven is sublime. Our life on earth is brief, but eternity is timeless. Okay? So let us therefore keep our eyes on Jesus and press on towards the mark of high calling so that at the last prophet call, we can all be with him in this awesome world. So as we reach the pearly gates of heaven, we can hear the master's voice say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of the Lord. Good morning and shalom. Praise